everyone, welcome to the uh, Provost Graduate Student uh, Lecture Series. Uh, we have this every semester. I'm uh, one of the uh, uh, selection committee members. My name is Hua Chong Leung from Psychology, so I want to welcome you all to hear this series. It's for our graduate students to have the opportunity to present uh, to the university community and to foster uh, uh, conversations uh, between disciplines. So that's our idea, and we like to select uh, graduate students from different departments, and today we have uh, someone from the Millset de department, and Professor uh, Peter Winkler will present uh, the speaker today. Well, so it's a real treat being able to introduce Eleanor to you, in case you don't know her. I first met Eleanor when she was, she actually finished her undergraduate degree at Stony Brook. Um, and uh, as soon as she walked in as, and started doing stuff in this class, which was a, a music theory class, I thought, this is not your typical undergraduate. You know, what's going on here? And, you know, and I mean, she wrote great stuff. We were, we were talking about jazz harmony. She wrote the most amazing new tune on a, old set of jazz changes, I thought, yeah, she knows something. This is, this is cool, very creative stuff. And then, of course, I talked to her and discovered that she was already a, a complete professional, had been working in the scene in New York for some time. Now, she's come back to us as a DMA-based student, uh, but this is only part of her life. She is not one of those six hours in the practice room you know, practicing the etudes kind of basis. She's, in fact, one of the most in-demand uh, players in the, in the scene in New York, uh, the, the downtown, the Brooklyn scene especially, playing, and as, as are a lot of these, this new generation of musicians playing, not just one kind of music, not just jazz or just classical, but anything that comes by. So she's been a member of a couple of groups. She, uh, that, uh, there's one group that was uh, called well, I'm looking. I got. Huh, yeah, I'm looking at her website. <laughs> yeah, which which won all kinds of you know a recognition from magazines like Time Out and New York and so forth. And I gather she's now working on a solo album of her own, of original material. And she works with many many composers. She's been associated with groups like with people like Philip Glass and groups like uh, Bang on the Can, and it's a very, very long list of people she's been working with. So this is the kind of student we love having at Stony Brook, because she's, she's already got a career. She's not you know, taking her DMA in order to like figure out what to do with her life. She knows what to do with her life. She's coming at Stony Brook because she wants the advantages of <coughs> Well, frankly, having a doctorate doesn't hurt uh, in terms of getting teaching gigs and, uh, and getting jobs that, uh, you know, maybe pay the bills. Let's face it, that's what many people are in, in our DMA program for. But it also brings such wonderful life and interest to this department. And uh, we're very lucky to have people like Eleanor around. So here she is, Eleanor Offen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Tough act to follow. Um, so you may have read the abstract, um, or you may not have, and you're just here on a whim. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing um, with my solo album, um, which is all uh, music for um, what we would call electroacoustic uh, music for the double bass, which means that uh, some of it is purely the acoustic sound of the instrument, and some of it is provided by um, electronics, processing, things of that nature. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to just give a little bit of background um, about the bass, uh, particularly the bass in a solo capacity, which is not its normal function. Um, many of you probably think about, uh, you know, rhythm section playing or, you know, people who sit at the back of the orchestra and don't really do much um, <laughs> when, you, when you imagine the double bass. We're doing a lot, even when we're not doing much. Um, but uh, recently, the, there has been more of a trend um, for the bass in a solo capacity. Um, so uh, basically, there's very little solo repertoire from pre-20th century for the instrument. Um, largely because the technique of the players 
was not nearly as advanced as, as it is today. Um, there have been huge advancements, pardon me, in the technique of the players themselves, and that in turn has encouraged people to write more and more challenging work for the instrument. Um, the, basically, the role of, uh, of the bass can change depending on what genre you're talking about. Um, this particular project is coming out of the Western classical tradition, but it's not, strictly speaking, Western classical music. Um, so the music on this record draws from various popular musics um, and lots of other non-Western traditions. Um, and I like to, I seek out things that are not just one little box. That's my, my goal in life is to never get stuck in one little, little tiny box. Um, so we'll talk more about that later, or I'll talk about it and you'll listen. Um, I'm gonna, I am, by the way, going to periodically open things up for questions, because I don't like it when people don't know what I'm saying and don't have an opportunity to tell me. Um, so uh, basically, uh, a lot of the music that has been written for the double bass uh, as a solo instrument uh, up until now is kind of bad. It's, um, you know, there's a tendency among composers to treat the bass as somewhat of a novelty in a solo context. Um, and so there have been a lot of pieces that are kind of jokey, kind of, oh, look at this, someone's playing the bass by themselves, isn't that funny? Um, I tend to steer clear of those pieces because I, I don't think it's funny at all. It's not, it's very difficult. Um, and so what I'm trying to do, uh, I've, I have an ongoing commissioning project, um, which this album is uh, one facet of. Um, and what I've been trying to do is commission as much new work for the instrument as possible from as many good up and coming composers as I can rope in to this project. And I've been doing this uh, since 2006, so it's an ongoing project. Um, there will be four pieces on the recording, um, but those are just a, a sampling of the actual body of work, which is constantly expanding. I have three new pieces uh, that are not finished yet that I'll probably have by the fall that are also part of this project that won't be on the record. Um, so I'm constantly trying to get more material, perform it as much as possible, and show people that this is an instrument that you should write for because it's a really cool instrument. Um, I actually sat down with uh, one of my best friends is a composer, many of my best friends are composers, and I asked her a few questions about what she found interesting about writing for the bass, because I wanted to hear it from a composer's perspective, and the first thing that came out of her mouth was drama. Um, <laughs> because the bass is such a large instrument, um, it's inherently dramatic. It's dramatic to watch someone play the instrument, it's dramatic to play the instrument, <laughs> Um, and because it's so large, it has a, a really big range, um, especially compared to other string instruments, um, which have relatively limited ranges. Uh, and by that, I mean in terms of low notes, high notes range. Um, and uh, another thing that's interesting about the bass is, is its versatility, is the fact that it, it can be found in uh, a lot of different genres of music. It's not, strictly speaking, a Western classical instrument, like, um, you know, the oboe. <laughs> um, that was just the first one that popped into my head. No, no offense to any oboists out there. Um, so, so it is versatile. Um, you can find it in a lot of different contexts, and that makes it interesting to, to write for, because um, you don't, you know, you're not bound to this tradition. Um, the, the other thing that my composer friend said that she finds exciting about writing for the bass is that it is completely freeing for the composer um, because it has less of a canonic body of work associated with it in the Western classical tradition. Uh, composers can feel free to draw on whatever sources they want because they really don't have a, uh, too much of a basis for comparison. Um, and they don't have this idea of being one, you know, step in a very long line of, of tradition. You know, you think piano, if you're a 
classical composer or a classically trained composer, you know, first thing that pops into your head are probably, you know, the big Brahms sonatas and the Bach well-tempered clavier and a thousand million other pieces that are associated with the piano and that immediately pop into your mind when you think about writing for that instrument. When composers sit down to write for the bass, they don't have anything to draw on <laughs> specifically. So it's very freeing for a composer to be able to just focus on the process and the product. And uh, at that point, you're ceasing writing for an instrument and you're just writing music that you want to write. And hopefully that the person you're writing it for is able to play. <laughs> Sometimes it happens that it's not playable. Uh, <laughs> so drama versatility, it's freeing, it's challenging. Um, another thing that my composer friend said, I'm, she asked to be nameless for whatever reason, um, was that uh, along the lines of the, the freedom that you get from not being part of a tradition, um, because the bass is physically limited in its capacity and the players are limited um, in their physical ability to get around the instrument. Uh, it, it presents a new challenge for the composer much the same way as a using a limited um, scale, for example, a limited set of pitches that you can use or a limited um, rhythmic figure that you can use. Um, so you have to get more creative with it because you have fewer tools in your toolbox. Um, so that, that was another thing that I found interesting from the composer's perspective. Um, just my personal mission, as I mentioned before, uh, is to get pieces that I like that are interesting to people who don't know anything about music, hopefully. <laughs> um, I think accessibility uh, is really important. And when I say accessibility, what I'm talking about is um, the risk of, of possibly offending some people, uh, not strictly speaking academic music. Um, there has been, for the last several decades, a sort of rabid argument <laughs> in, the, in the music world, in the classical tradition side of things, um, about uh, the relative merits of academic music and popular music. Um, and academic music is uh, just, the quick and dirty explanation is it's music written um, by uh, people within academia for people within academia to study. Um, that's a really, really simplistic explanation and I could probably lecture five more hours on that and I won't because it's gonna be really boring for you. Um, Popular music has more and more been influencing the Western classical composers, um, especially those of my generation. Um, people that I know who I went to conservatory with, who you know, got trained in the same way that their predecessors have for decades and centuries, now you know, use all kinds of different elements in their work. They use electronics, they use um, you know, electronic instruments, they use um, non-Western instruments, they don't feel like they have to limit themselves. And I think that's a really exciting trend in composition in general. Um, and that's sort of where things are headed, um, at least with the composers of my generation who are working in New York. I'll be as specific as possible to avoid any liability. Um, I just wanna stop right here uh, to see if anybody has any questions about anything I just said. Wow, okay. <laughs> if you think of one, just raise your hand. Um, so, so my aesthetic, as I said, uh, tends to lean more towards the accessible end of things. Um, music that you know, makes you wanna move around, strikes an emotional chord, um, as opposed to <laughs> what I often term bleep bloop music, which is music that makes you think, but is not immediately grasping you as soon as, you, as, soon as it hits your ear. Um, there's no, I'm not putting any value, relative value on either of those things. I'm just saying that I prefer things that tend to be a little more accessible. Um, so the composers that I asked to write me things for this project are composers who share my musical values. Um, 
They're all early to mid-career composers. Um, most of them are based in New York. Um, there's a really big scene, in, uh, he mentioned the Brooklyn downtown scene. <laughs> um, there was a huge split in the 60s and 70s um, in that same classical you know, community within the conservatories of people who were considered uptown, which is towards the more academic side of things, and then people who are quote unquote downtown artists who tended to embrace, embrace a more um, avant-garde or uh, boundary-pushing attitude, um, were more open to things like you know, letting popular music influence their work. The, the quintessential quote-unquote downtown artists are people like Philip Glass, Steve Reich, Meredith Monk, um, and then you know, on the dance end of things, there's a whole host of other people, and they were all collaborating, and it was a lovely scene. That scene has now kind of moved itself further downtown into Brooklyn, which is kind of the epicenter of where all exciting music is happening now. <laughs> um, so sometimes you'll hear people refer to a Brooklyn scene or Brooklyn composers. It doesn't really mean anything. Just means the younger generation of, of sort of exciting composers who are trying new things. Um, that was a, a bit of a tangent. Um, so yes, those composers largely based in New York and Brooklyn. Um, they're, f the actual pieces are, each one is almost completely different uh, from the last, which I really like, but um, on the whole, when I play them as a set, which is generally about 45 to an hour's worth of music, um, four or five pieces, um, although they're completely different from each other, uh, it works as a cohesive unit, and that's kind of what I was looking for for this album, um, was to take four of those that are uh, representative sampling of the kinds of different things that you can do with the instrument, um, but that still work as a whole album's worth of music. Um, now we go on to the music business end of things, <laughs> which is my least favorite, but I love to talk about it. Um, <laughs> I actually, I recently gave a lecture on just this very thing for about two hours at Central Michigan University. And in doing so, realized that none of these kids had any idea what I was talking about. And these were music students, which really scares me. Um, because in academia, in the music world, um, there has been a tradition of uh, expecting that if your students are at the top of their game uh, technique-wise and talent-wise, that they will somehow manage to have a career, um, magically. <laughs> What's unfortunate is that uh, that can't really happen in the way that it used to happen anymore. And we need to really catch up to that within conservatories, music departments. Um, we need to start better preparing our students for the real world. Um, every music department and every conservatory should have a music business class, if they can afford to. I mean, it, it, the fact that every conservatory and every department doesn't is frightening to me. Um, there should be uh, music technology classes available to anyone of any major in every department. Um, because that is also a huge part of the future of where this is going. Where is it all going? Is that not there right now? There, it, you know, it's, it's on a school by school basis. We have at Stony Brook a wonderful um, electronic music lab that and anyone can take these classes, but so few people do, or people who are not composers, <laughs> because they find it intimidating and because no one ever told them that it was going to be important. Um, if, so, if more people told younger students that this was going to be important, those classes would be full every semester. Um, yes? That's really changing now. We have this whole new consortium called CDACT, and lots and lots of kids are in that, undergrads of various kinds from all kinds of fields. So yeah. We're going to change I th I th right. Yeah. So we don't have a music business class. I think it's great that we're doing that, because yeah. we're already leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of other programs in that respect. Um, music business class, 
uh, even if it's just teaching you how to make a website. Mm -hmm. These are skills that people don't learn. I've seen some really unprofessional looking websites by some very professional musicians. Um, <laughs> Websites, uh, you know, just how to write a grant proposal. This is something you don't learn. I had to figure it out. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just, it's like, you don't know where to start with this stuff unless someone kind of nudges you in the right direction. Um, so that was my spiel about that. I, I think that it's really important for us to talk about these things more um, in conservatories and music departments. Um, and having said that, I'm going to talk about it in sort of more broad terms. Um, there are some really big questions afloat now. Um, the biggest of which is, would be why make a record? <laughs> why are we making an album? Traditionally, you know, people made a record because some you know, A&R person at some big label had scouted them and given them money to make a record. And then the label owned the record. Um, now, everything is DIY. Absolutely everything. Um, people make the record in their bedroom on their laptop with the equipment that has been relatively inexpensive for them to purchase. Um, and then they put it on YouTube and they get five bazillion hits and they're a superstar. Um, and so most of the music industry is catching up to that model. But uh, unfortunately, in the world of new music, um, you'll see a lot of air quotes because I, I have a problem with certain terms, but I have to use them because there aren't better, better ones. Um, in the world of new music, we haven't really caught up to that model. Um, we're starting to catch up now, um, but the traditional Classical music model has always been, you probably play a competition, you might win it, or you might play second or third, then that gets you a recording contract. Or you get a debut at Carnegie Hall and somebody hears you, and then that gets you a recording contract. Um, or it gets you management, and then that gets you a recording contract. Um, that's not the future. And the larger labels are struggling uh, because they can't sustain themselves in that model. Um, so the bigger questions, why make a record? Um, most artists don't make record, uh, record sale money anymore, or at least not significant amounts of it. Um, whatever money you make from record sales generally just goes towards recouping the cost that you put up, because you probably did it yourself. Um, so in that case, what purpose does it serve to make this record? Um, the biggest purpose that I can see is that it is the ultimate publicity tool. Um, it's your best business card ever. Uh, handing someone a record is more immediate than handing them a business card and having them have to do a bunch of research on their own. Um, Things like uh, online media outlets or smaller publications don't often do live concert reviews, um, but they will review a record, so more publicity there. Um, you can put it online, that's instant publicity. Um, it, it is more of a career advancement tool than anything else at this point. Um, and it's also an artifact that you can have, which I still think is important. Um, also, when you make a recording, that's sort of the completion of the writing process. Um, if, let's say I'm working with Joe Schmo on a piece and we've gone through seven different drafts of it and I've premiered it and then I've played a completely different version and then a third version and I'm like, don't know if it's ever going to be done. If I say to the composer, I'm going to record this and that's it then that there ends the writing process. So it kind of gives the composer an end goal um, with their process. Sometimes composers can be a little <laughs> weird about that, um, <laughs> depending on who you speak to. Um, so it's good to, it's kind of a final product. It's a, you know, cherry on the top of the process of writing the piece. Um, 
DIY versus label. Um, these are questions that I'm actually asking myself right now because I haven't decided yet. So if anyone has any ideas for me and you want to come talk to me afterwards, please feel free. Um, DIY has a lot of pros to it. Um, the biggest pro is that you have complete creative control over your product. Um, you own your masters, um, and by that I mean the final mastered tape, which is not tape anymore, but we still say that. Um, <laughs> And you have control over absolutely every aspect of your project. Artwork, um, you know, mixing, mastering, all of that. You can use whoever you want. You can do it yourself, but it's all within your, your complete control, which is great if you're totally OCD and you like to have control over everything. Some people don't. Um, so that's a, that's a pro as far as I'm concerned. Owning your own masters is a huge pro because traditionally when you record for a label, they own your masters and you can't get those back unless you pay them oodles and oodles of money and often it involves lawsuits and it's just really messy. Um, that's within the traditional label model. Um, not worrying about fitting in with any particular labels specific aesthetics or um, preconceived ideas about what should or should not be on their label. Um, there, you know, there's a lot to be said for, for being associated with a label uh, as far as you know, helping to identify a potential audience for your music, but it can be very restricting as well. So those are two ends of that. Um, working at your own pace on your own timeline. Don't discount that because when you're do, when you're working with a label, it's like they're, they're just setting the deadlines for you, and you're just constantly scrambling to meet those deadlines. Um, I know because I do have a lot of experience with labels, and some of it's good and some of it's bad, which I can get back to in a second. Um, keeping all the money you make, if you do it yourself, you have to put up the full cost on the front end, but then you keep everything you get on the back end, which, like I said before, probably means breaking even. Um, but at least you're not you know, in debt afterwards. And you don't owe thousands of dollars to a label, as you would have in the past. Because um, traditionally, the label puts up the costs for studio fees and all that stuff, and publicity, and yada, yada you then have to pay them back out of your record sales to recoup those costs. And if you don't sell enough records, you just have to give them the money somehow. Um, cons to DIY. You have to take care of your own publicity and your own distribution, which is a lot of work. Most of us don't have time and don't want to make time for that sort of thing because it takes hours and hours out of your day. Um, and we already have to do enough of it with just existing as artists. <laughs> we have to send out emails, we have to update our website, we have to call bookers, we have to deal with contracts. We have to, and these are things we do every day for way more time than we're comfortable with. Um, so it's a hassle to have to do that. It's nice to have someone do it for you. Um, having to do uh, your own press is tied in with uh, having to do your own booking. Um, Often when you release something through a label, they will book shows for you in support of your album. So you don't have to do that yourself, which is nice. Um, on the label end of things, pros are the exact opposite of everything I just said, pretty much. <laughs> they take care of your distribution, they take care of your publicity, they will you know, book shows for their artists, um, often in combination with other artists who are on their label, who might have a bigger name, and you might be able to glom onto some of their stardom. And hopefully some of it will rub off on you. Um, cons are some labels let you own your, your masters, but a lot of them don't, like I mentioned before. Um, each label has a different business model for how they deal with upfront costs versus um, how much of your record sales you get to keep. Um, I am on with Victoire, the group that he mentioned before, I am on a label called New Amsterdam Records, um, which has a more artist-friendly business model. 
um, you put up the production costs and then you get to keep 90% of your profits after that, which is really nice. Um, the reason they're like that is because the people who own the label are artists themselves, not just business people. Um, there's a label called Innova Records, which is, uh, tends to cater towards uh, more experimental stuff, um, new music, um, you know, less traditional uh, jazz artists, things of that nature. Um, Innova basically, it's a record label, but it's more of a distribution and publicity machine for you. Um, you put up all the cost yourself, and then you get all of the profits. Um, from your record sales, but they take care of distribution and publicity, which is great. Um, because distribution is another thing. Um, there are a couple of companies that basically control all of distribution for the whole world. For classical music, Naxos distributes everything everywhere. Um, and if you can't get Naxos to distribute your record, then you're pretty much stuck just doing online distribution because Naxos owns everything. Um, so those are just a, a few of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, also, if a label decides they don't like your final product after you're finished recording it and it's all mixed and mastered, they can just throw it out if they want to, which makes me want to cry. <laughs> because the amount of work, work that you put into even just the product before you mix it and master it in a studio is like, I mean, it's, it's enough to make you cry. Um, so that's, that's also on the cons list. Um, if you do decide to do it yourself, then you run into a whole host of other issues, like how do I get money for my project? Um, basically, there are two ways to get money um, that are universally recognized as the best, most direct ways to get money for your project. One of those is to get a grant, and the other is to crowdfund. Um, everyone crowdfunds everything these days. Um, I can't tell you how many emails I get per day of people asking me to go on Kickstarter and give them $20. And a lot of their projects I really respect. I think they're doing great work. These are colleagues and friends of mine. But uh, I'm kind of sick of Kickstarter. Um, so then the question is like, are we oversaturated by Kickstarter now? Um, I think in certain circles, yes, we are oversaturated by Kickstarter and we need to start looking elsewhere. There are other crowdfunding sites that are sort of less in your face, but um, I think the whole crowdfunding website phenomenon is very useful, but perhaps maybe not the be all end all of of getting funding for your project. I chose to um, seek out grant money first before trying to crowdfund for that reason. Um, and so I had to figure out how to write grant applications. And I figured that out and no one told me. And I read Grant Writing for Dummies, which is a very useful book. You can find it at your local library. Uh, and then I applied for and got a grant from a wonderful organization called New Music USA. Um, I hope they're watching this because I'm supposed to talk about them every time I talk about this project. Uh, New, New Music USA is a grant making organization, which, uh, of which there are a few. Um, it is actually a sort of conglomerate of two uh, grant-making organizations. One of them was called Meet the Composer, and the other one was called American Music Center. Um, those two companies merged, and now they're called New Music USA, and what they do is they give out money to people for a variety of different projects. There are specific guidelines for each of their grants. They re-grant money, which means that they get grant money from larger organizations, and then they decide how to divvy that up. Um, and I would strongly recommend to anyone who's trying to do a similar project to what I'm doing, which is um, not a strictly popular music <laughs> project, uh, that grant making organizations are your first stop. Um, so thank you, New Music USA, for your money. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? 
Um, there's the NEA, barely. Uh, there's NIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts, um, which is more useful for, they give out a little bit of grant money per year. Um, it tends to be very targeted. Um, but they're more useful for showing you other sources of, of funding. Um, so NIFA.org is fantastic for if you're looking for grant, grant money for anything. Um, and the NEA is good. Um, there are private uh, grants that you can get. Um, and there are also just benefactors who want to give you money for projects. Um, those people tend to focus more on sort of larger scale projects than the one I'm, I'm working on. Um, but they are out there. Um, these are people like the Soros family and um, others like them. Uh, but your chances of getting a grant that you apply for are much stronger than your chances of somehow going to a party, meeting an insanely rich person, and them writing you a check at the end of the evening. <laughs> Which has happened, not to me, but to people I know. And I'm insanely jealous. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Okay, so um, those are just a, a lot of different issues. Um, that's my phone. A lot of different issues that are connected with just making a record, any kind of record. Um, what I want to do is play you a couple of examples from my record, and then you can ask me any questions you want about those. The first um, example I'm going to play is the title track. It's a piece called Home. Um, it's by a composer named Jenny Olivia Johnson. Um, and it uses, it's for double bass with uh, distortion and delay. Um, those are guitar effects pedals that I use with my bass. Um, so it, it um, integrates a kind of um, noise rock sensibility into um, a what you might call post-minimalist piece. That was a lot of labels. Too many labels. Do you mind if I ask a question? No, please ask one. Otherwise I'm just standing here and you're all staring at me while I fight technology. Um, in making a record uh, whether it's DIY or through a label, do you think that part of it um, incorporates the, your target audience? Or is it a thing where you make the, the record for yourself to get yourself out there and you don't really pay mind to who necessarily gets their hand on it? Um, it's interesting that you brought up target audience because I was going to talk about that and then I realized that was too much talking. Mm -hmm. um, Along the lines of everything that I've been saying about DIYing your project, uh, you very often have to DIY your target audience as well. Um, so disseminating your project online um, is the fastest way to grow your audience. Um, but also just going to other people's shows and handing it out is a really great way to expand your audience. Um, I, I hope that sort yeah, of... Yeah, absolutely. Answer. So say I, I, can, I find just that little bit that you play, I, I think it's very interesting, but I know maybe a handful of other people who would also find that interesting. Yeah. Well, it's more than a handful, but you have to seek them out. Right. right. Yeah. Let's try it again.
So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Basically, the piece just keeps building and building and building until at the end it's a wall of sound. Um, so I'm just going to skip a little bit to probably where we were before. And then to the end. And you can hear that it really utilizes the full range of the instrument, um, which is something I encourage. And then it just ends with... Okay, so that's one... Stop it. <laughs> Uh, that's one, one example of what you can do. I just want to play one part of, or a couple shorter parts of a contrasting example. Um, I love putting these two together. It's so good. So this is a piece for um, pre-recorded sample which uh, is taken off of a French documentary. Um, and multi-tracked bass. So I'm playing with myself um, in several different layers. And multi-tracked voice. So I'm singing also, and I'm singing with myself. And when I do it live, um, I do it with playback from a laptop. So I play essentially one bass track and one vocal track and um, all of the pre-recorded stuff and then I just sing and play on top of that. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Come on, skip! It's not letting me skip for some reason. There we go. So this is, you can hear lots of different kinds of music in here, I'm sure. Okay, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. <laughs> he made me selfish at all. Really fast.
Okay, so those are just a little few, few little nuggets. Um, and those are uh, non-mixed, barely edited tracks. So the balance is gonna be a little weird, but I just wanted to give you some of an idea. So what, what was the name of that piece? That was called Crocodile. Um, Florent Gis, he's a bass player and composer, um, which is why uh, that piece is the most idiomatic to the instrument <laughs> in my collection. Um, but he's a phenomenal bass player and composer, good friend of mine. Great. Any more questions? You all look sort of glassy eyed. So where, how, how are you? Well, you haven't decided. You're gonna, you're gonna haven't decided yet. I'm maybe um, I'm there's a couple of possibilities label wise that I'm still not ruling out um, but I'm, I'm really sort of struggling with it which is one of the reasons why I wanted to present because I thought that if I presented on it I would force myself to think about it in, <laughs> in different ways um, which ended up being the case which was helpful um, but I hope it was informative for you too, and not too shop speaky. I tried to make it as accessible as possible. No, so if I can just comment. This yeah. Is, you know, you're dealing with we're all musicians are dealing with a, a world that is turned totally upside down from what it was about 20 years ago because there was an establishment that had been built over the over many decades of major labels, large corporations that handle all our music, radio networks, and so forth, tend to be very centralized and, uh, and have lots of money and lots of power. And, and it made it possible for artists to get recorded, but they were always sort of at the mercy of this. Those companies are struggling for their lives. They're not signing new artists. And it's, and, yeah, and it's all because of the web. Mm -hmm. and really turned everything upside down, and um, it's it's a very challenging world to try to exist in. It is. And the other great aspiration for basis is to find a nice, comfortable gig with a symphony orchestra with a pension. Right. There are a few left, but there aren't too many, and you still hear about labor disputes and things like that. You know, symphony orchestras are struggling. The whole older structure of how music, both classical and, and pop music, was done in this country is is completely being reconfigured and who knows what we're going to end up with. But increasingly people are doing what Eleanor is doing, which is... Doing it yourself. Doing it yourself. Taking it to the streets. Yeah. 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 But it also seems exciting too, because you have more freedom. Yeah, it is exciting. I mean, with the freedom comes peril and anxiety, but it's also very exciting. Yeah. Any, any other musings? From the back, yeah. I have a question. Have you, in this project or any project you're working on, have you found any, I guess, deep relationship between the Brooklyn scene and stuff going on in Europe? Because I know this electroacoustic stuff, something similar, I guess, you're in Berlin and parts of Portugal and the UK. Is yeah. There much of a connection over it? We, I mean, I've found that, um, thank you very much again. I, I've found, um, I've met some of the people who are doing similar things in, in those places, and we all kind of share common goals and values. Um, there just happen to be more of us in a smaller geographic area here than there are in any, in any of those places. And those places are very different um, establishment-wise in that their government gives them tons of money to do whatever they want, essentially, <laughs> which is great. Um, but there's less of a, like a DIY aesthetic in those places because there doesn't have to be. Um, but there is an interest in this kind of music, for sure. Um, uh, like you said, Germany, there's a lot of people doing stuff like this. Um, there's a great uh, label in it's based out of London called Non-Classical that has a lot of stuff like this on it. It's run by a composer named Gabriel Prokofiev, who is Prokofiev's great something, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there are like-minded people. It just happen, it happens that a lot of them come to New York. I hope that was part of an answer. Yeah, that's good. So I mean, it's important to point out what the crucial thing is, is a community. 
Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't do this out of your absolutely bedroom, your bedrooms in South Dakota, and you don't know any other musicians. Right. Oh, that reminds me of another wonderful uh, record label called Bedroom Community. <laughs> it's based in Reykjavik, um, and I kid you not, they do a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, uh, you do have to have a community. You can do stuff in your bedroom, and more people are doing stuff in their bedroom, but you need to, in order to get this kind of support that you need, you just need to be around other people who are trying to do that. Otherwise, it can get very bleak. Mm -hmm. You can spend long winters in your, in your house just wondering what, what's going to happen to you and searching the internet for other people who are wondering what they're going, you know. Um, but yes, it is really, and there is a really good community that I am a part of, and I'm every day thankful for that. Anything else? Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.